What's up? I'm Jonathan and welcome to Maker Tales, where I'm sharing my maker journey to help you go further in yours. So don't forget to subscribe and hit that little bell icon to never miss an opportunity to keep making. In this video, we're going to be working off the knowledge from the first video, which is how to design a laser cut finger joint box accurately. In this video, I'll be showing you how to make a mechanical lid lock. This mini mechanism will be using four individual sliding lock pins which we will develop in future videos to be able to move all four pins with one rotational movement. Plus, we're going to be keeping to the no glue theme for now. This is going to be a great video for the very basics and fundamentals of puzzle box design. And if you haven't seen the first finger joint box video, I strongly suggest that you watch that one first, as I am not going to go over how to find the perfect joint parameters in this video. The link to that video is down in the description. Once again, I'll be using Rhino 3D but feel free to use your own preferred vector editing program. Just remember to stay laser accurate. Before we go any further, I would like to explain what I like to call layered design and sandwich mechanisms. Honestly, I don't know if there are any actual words for these concepts. To me, the concept of layer design is the idea of slicing a 3D design into layers of assembly. For example, the lid of the first box already had a form of layered design. We had two pieces which we joined together to make one solid, slightly more complicated part. A sandwich mechanism plays off the same idea, except there are usually four or more layers involved, along with moving and usually mechanically interacting parts, sandwiched in between the top and bottom layers. To make the next coming steps a little easier to understand, here is a visual explaining the layer names that I use. Starting from the top down, we begin with the user interface layer, which I also call the UI layer. This is the very outer layer of the sandwich mechanism. This is usually the layer that has all the switches, knobs, buttons, cogs, and sliders. Under the UI layer, you get the top layer. This layer, along with the bottom layer, are solely there to keep the mechanism together. In between the top and bottom layer, you have the mechanism layer or in more complicated designs, the mechanism layers. Now that we know the general understanding of a sandwich mechanism, let's get on to the first design. Here's where we left off our finger joint box design, our initial box with a simple lid. To take this lid to the next level, let's start with just the internal and external dimensions of the box. Now with these dimensional constraints, let's reapply that 0.5 millimeter offset to the internal part of the lid. Plus I'll give the corners a small fillet. This will let us have a little bit more wiggle room, especially while working with wood, as zero tolerance designing is usually not a good idea with natural materials. From here, I'm going to be adding a few construction lines. This will make it easier to find the center point and other points of interest. These construction lines will be removed later on and are only there to aid the designing process. All these lines will be in red from now on. As this is a relatively simple design, I'm going to jump straight into the internal mechanism. Generally speaking, I usually work from the UI and top layer downwards when creating more complicated designs. So getting straight to it, in essence, we have one sliding lock pin mechanism, which is repeated four times. To work smart and not hard, we are going to just design one of these lock pins and then copy the other three in place. Using my construction lines, I'll place a 15 mm wide lock pin from the center to the outer limits, which will become the top layer outline later on. From here, we need to keep in mind the movement we are wanting to achieve with this lock pin. I want this pin to move a minimum of three millimeters back to be able to unlock the box. As a rule of thumb, I usually add an extra 0.5 to one millimeter of movement, if I'm able to do so. Adding this extra little bit means the pin will now move back four millimeters. It's pretty obvious in this design that the pins will not get in the way of each other, but it's still good practice to check this. To do this, I'll add a 15 millimeter construction line box to the left of the lock pin. From here, we can see that the full range of motion is not going to get in the way of any other pin. To interact with the lock pin, we need a way to interact with the UI layer. To add a simple sliding button to the UI layer, we need to keep in mind that we are working in a sandwich mechanism. This means we need to go through the top layer to reach the UI layer. 
To do this, we will add a hole through the top layer. This hole will let us add a pin joint from the sliding button to the sliding lock pin. Let's start this connection from the mechanism layer, adding a hole to the lock pin for the pin joint. Going up a layer, we are now on the top layer. I'll make this layer green to make it easier to distinguish. While adding the hole to the top layer, we need to keep in mind the range of movement of the connecting pin joint. This means that we need to make the hole 4mm longer in one direction to let the pin joint shaft move freely. Lastly, going up one more layer, we reach the UI layer. I've colored this layer magenta. Personally, I would like to hide the hole in the top layer for this design, meaning that I'll make my button 18mm by 18mm. I'll also give the button a small fillet on the corners and finish it off by adding a pin joint hole. Hiding the construction lines, this is what we're currently ending up with. To finish off the design, we need to add all the moving parts into the mechanism layer. To do this, I'll bring the construction lines back and use the center point to help place three copies of the full mechanism rotating at 90 degrees as I go along. We're almost there, only three more steps till the end. Staying on the mech layer, now that everything is in place, we need to add the standoffs. Standoffs are the part of the mechanism layer that do not move and are there purely to keep the top and bottom layers off the moving parts. In essence, they are the empty spaces in the mech layer. To make these standoffs, I'll look for the areas in the mech layer that need support. This will usually be the whole outer perimeter and any large voids. These standoffs are then held in place by pin joints and hold the entire sandwich mechanism together. Keep in mind the movement of the mechanism to make sure not to accidentally impede it with a standoff. While making these standoffs and adding all these pin joints to all the other layers, let's also check each layer to make sure it has everything it needs. Most notably, it's the outer perimeter of the bottom and top layers. Fundamentally, that's the tricky part done. All that's really left to do with the sandwich mechanism now is to add all the curve compensation, a couple of fillets to make sure nothing catches on itself, and then what I like to do is add a small 0.25 margin to any moving parts to make sure that there isn't any additional friction on any of the moving connections. With that done, you should have something that ends up looking a little like this. On to the last step. You may have noticed that currently the lid would not fit on the current finger box design. This has been intentional to keep the layers in the sandwich mechanism to a minimum. What's left to do now is a small edit to the box faces plus a small edit to the top layer of the sandwich mechanism. Let's start with the top layer. The outcome of these small edits is to create an interlocking lid. To do this, we need to remove as much of the overlapping lid rim, but keep just enough that will still hold the lid in place to slide the lock pins into place. To do this, I'll be removing all the rim apart from a 11mm finger that will slot into the rim of the box. Now onto the box faces. We need to add a small slot to let this finger slot into. Plus, we'll be adding a small hole to let the lock pins slide into. I know the hole for the lock pins is 9.5mm away from the edge of the top layer and three millimeters down due to the thickness of my material. I'll also be adding a 0.5 millimeter offset to this hole to give it a little bit of wiggle room. A few finishing touches such as fillets to the slots and that's the design done. Now it's a simple case of separating the layers of the design, nesting it and cutting it out. Once cut, I hit it with a little bit of sandpaper on all the moving and exposed parts. From here, it's a case of simply assembling it. Make sure you take care with the orientation of the parts while putting them together, as these parts can be put on backwards or inside out. A rubber mallet can come in handy to persuade the pins to go in, but make sure they go in straight, because if you don't, there is a high chance of splitting the wood when they go through to the other side. A small thing I would like to mention is that all these designs have no glue. 
This does not mean that a small amount of glue won't help, especially when it comes to the degradation of joints after a long amount of time due to changes in humidity and wear and tear. But personally, in my experience, using these finger joints, I have not had a single problem with any of my puzzle boxes that I've developed over four years ago. You've made it! Now you've just understood the basic fundamentals of puzzle box design. That's right, technically speaking, you could see this as a very simple four-step puzzle box. Next up, we're going to be working off the fundamentals of that design to move all four pins with one quick little rotation. In fact, from there, the sky's the limit. We're even going to cover a 15-step puzzle box and so much more. So thanks for watching. Keep making and let the quest continue.